Hey there, this is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I am very, very excited for today's show. It is with someone I've wanted to interview for a very long time. His name is Dr. William Pollock. He is uh, one of the world's foremost authorities on pulsed electromagnetic fields, which is a, subje a subject I've had some personal interest in for a few years now, uh, but I've yet to do a podcast on because, quite frankly, I've been waiting to interview this particular expert that I have on the show today. Uh, he has uh, an MD. He's held previous positions at Johns Hopkins University and the University of Maryland. He has extensive training in a variety of uh, forms of integrative medicine as well, including acupuncture and hypnosis, uh, nutrition and body work and other areas. And he's considered one of the world's foremost authorities on the practical use of pulsed electromagnetic fields. Uh, and he's written an incredible book that I highly recommend called Power Tools for Health. This is something I bought, I think, two or three years ago when I first got interest, interested in this topic. And I found myself just highlighting and, and taking notes rampantly. It's just power packed. There's hundreds of references in this book. And it's really the only book on pulsed electromagnetic fields that I can, can recommend. Um, because, quite frankly, there's a lot of uh, nonsense and pseudoscience around in this field. And uh, I'm sure that's something that we'll talk about in this podcast. But uh, one other thing I'll mention about Dr. Pollock, he in, uh, in 2019, he received the American College of Integrative Medicine Lifetime Achievement Award for his work with PEMFs. And he also received uh, the Maryland's Top Preventative Medicine Specialist Award in 2021. So congratulations on those, Dr. Pollock, and welcome to the show. It's such a pleasure to finally connect with you. Um, it's a pleasure uh, connecting with you as well. I've been looking at your work for some time and also wanted to be connected. Awesome. <laughs> well, I'm glad we're finally making it happen. So post electromagnetic fields, this is, I, I almost want to play, play a little bit dumb in this interview and pretend like I haven't read much about it because this was something that I had so many questions on and found myself having uh, a lot of skepticism of and a lot of difficulty wrapping my head around certain distinctions that I think are important ones. Um, so let me, let me just start by asking you to give our audience um, an overview of what exactly PMF is for someone who knows nothing about this topic and has no idea what PMFs are, post electromagnetic fields are, how would you explain it and what are the benefits of it? So pulse magnetic fields are magnetic fields that are produced by current flowing through a wire, electrical current flowing through a wire. So we know that about power lines and power lines put off magnetic fields. Uh, they are they are not the kinds of magnetic fields we want for healing purposes, but even those electric, those power power line magnetic fields can have health benefits. Uh, they're not controlled, but they can have potentially have have health benefits. And studies have been done using 50 hertz and 60 hertz, which is what the power line frequencies are, depending on whether you're in the U.S. or in Europe. So basically, a current um, that's flowing will produce a magnetic field. That's called the right hand rule. So this is the direction of the current, the direction of my thumb, and the magnetic field is perpendicular to, to that current flow. So the magnetic field is wrapping around that wire basically in this sort of fashion, and it's a closed loop. So every time the current flows, the magnetic field goes like this. Every time it pulses, it goes like that, right? So it's open and close, open and close, open and close. As opposed to radio signals or microwaves that are in the atmosphere, they basically broadcast out into the atmosphere. Those are waves, and those are wavelengths, just like you know waves in a pond. Uh, those those fields, those electromagnetic fields, are not the same as pulsed electromagnetic fields. And Tesla was one of the first people to actually discover that if you take a, a, a wire, so a wire that's connecting current into a lamp or an outlet, is basically going in two directions. There's an outgoing loop of the wire and a backwards loop in the wire. And where the two wires are crossing, the magnetic field produced by each one is neutralized. And that's called Lenz's law. So Tesla discovered that if you take that wire that's going like this, 
and you open it up, right? And then bring it back. That opening then creates, then each loop of that, each part of that loop is able to create a magnetic field that is active. It's not being canceled. So the magnetic field then, because it's pulsing in and out, essentially it's pulsing in and out of the body completely. The body is completely transparent to a magnetic field. To a magnetic field, the body does not exist, but the magnetic field exists to the body. So in other words, the magnetic field ignores the body. It doesn't pay any attention to the body, whether it's a body or an insect or a tree or any living matter for that matter. So unless it's metal in which, case the magnetic field will bounce around the metal, will, will be twisted, pushed away by the metal. And, but, and just, just maybe to make a distinction there for people who didn't quite follow that. So the magnetic field is penetrating through the body in, as if it's not there. The body is not an impediment to it, like, like in, to contrast it with, let's say, ultraviolet radiation can pass through the atmosphere and, and go down and down. But as soon as it hits our skin, pretty much all of that UV radiation stops. It doesn't go beneath the layer of the skin. It gets absorbed. Right. So uh, that happens because those are waves mm -hmm. and they're extremely short wavelengths. And as a result, they, they don't get absorbed. So microwaves do the same thing. They don't get absorbed. So they create heating and they can create damage in, in the body depending on how deep they go and how strong the magnetic field or the fields are, the electromagnetic field, because that's all part of the electromagnetic spectrum as it's called. So uh, probably an easier way to see this is that a magnetic field is like wind. It's going through the tree. It doesn't stop. It doesn't stay in the tree. It's passing on through. And as it passes through, its activity jiggles the leaves, the branches and the stronger the wind, the more action there is in the trees. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to rip a tree apart. You could do that with magnetic fields too, pulse magnetic fields. But certainly we don't want to do that because that's not the intent of pulse magnetic fields. The intent is to try to do activate processes in the body that will create healing. And so that's what happens. As the magnetic field, these therapeutic magnetic fields pass, through, they're called extremely low frequency fields, and they're also rel relatively low intensity magnetic fields. Most of the magnetic fields that we use are much lower intensity than MRIs. Okay, they're very high intensity magnetic fields. They're Tesla, they're 10,000, 20,000 Gauss. So they're very high intensity. Most of the therapeutic magnetic fields are low intensity. And because they're low, they're like, the, they're like a breeze in the trees, mm -hmm. right? Not a big wind going through the trees. And as it's passing through, it creates charge. So that the concept of creating charge is based on a relatively old law of physics called Faraday's law. So Faraday's law, Faraday was the first to discover that when you pass a magnetic field um, past a current flowing wire, uh, uh, sorry, when you pass a magnet past a current flowing wire, you'll create a, you'll induce charge. So he showed a needle going like this when you, the magnet was passing those wires. Now we don't use what we don't use magnets anymore to do this. Now we create this field that just goes like this. So basically, again, what you're doing is as it's passing through the body, anything that has charge associated with it will be influenced by the magnetic field. So the magnetic field then begins to activate those processes in the body that are charge related. So ions, electrolytes, nerves, uh, anything conducting in the body, it's conducting charges in the body. And so everything will be activated, so even down at the cellular level, at the molecular level. So you're, because it's, it's, the body's completely transparent to a magnetic field, everything in the body is affected by the magnetic field passing through. Mm -hmm. So whether it's passing through an eye or a brain or a, a, a fist or a shoulder or a heart or a lung or belly, you name it, doesn't really matter. As it's passing through, it's creating all this action. And that action then initiates all kinds of um, balancing processes in the body. Healthy cells, healthy tissue ignores the magnetic field. It says, oh, that was interesting. I like that tickle. I was tickled slightly. So that's great. But cells that are damaged are damaged because they couldn't finish the job of rebalancing. So the damage that caused the damage, the thing, the stimulus that caused the damage to the cell was too strong for the cell to be able to rebalance itself. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I whisper to you and I tell you, you dirty son of a person, whatever, but I'm just whispering. Your brain's going to say, la-di-da, 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 right? You ignore it. Now we're having a conversation 
it's harder to ignore that conversation. If I'm screaming and yelling at you, you'll never be able to block it. Mm -hmm. So the cells themselves then will use that energy. So when I'm out of, uh, I'm out of balance, then the body says, okay, I need help to get back into balance. And essentially that's what the increase in charge in the body is doing is giving the cells more energy to be able to rebalance. Mm -hmm. And so what would you say, let's say there's, um, I'm sure as an MD yourself, you probably encounter a lot of other MDs who have never heard of pulsed electromagnetic fields who are enormously skeptical of it and who might listen to what you just said and say, okay, well, that's a nice theory, but you know, are, is there any actual science to show that this has any actual meaningful benefit on medical conditions? What, what would you say in response to that? And I would say, here's the book. <laughs> It's not my word. There's 500 references in the book. Right. right? So what, but what, what are those benefits? What has this been proven to do as far as um, practical benefits for people dealing with different kinds of, of health problems? So in the book, I outlined 25 different actions of magnetic fields. And since the book, um, I discovered basically three more. Oh, interesting. So one is adenosine, the adenosine receptor, which has to do with ATP, which is a energy production in the body. The miracle of PEMFs is that it causes ATP to be produced. But ATP by itself is nothing. It's a molecule sitting there. So it's got potential energy. Mm -hmm. It has the potential to produce energy. Then what you have to do is you have to hydrolyze it. You have to take off one of the hydroxyl groups, and then that releases energy. That's where the energy release comes. So you need the hydro, hydrolysis to, to release energy. Then you've got, you go from AT, ADP to ATP, adenosine diphosphate, two phosphates, to ATP, three phosphates. And then you have to strip off one of the phosphates that releases energy that goes back to ADP. So PEMFs work on the entire cycle. They cause that cycle to be repeating itself continuously. So that's one of the key aspects of magnetic field therapy is the recycling of energy. The next uh, consideration is um, the endocannabinoid system. So now people are into um, marijuana and CBD and those are, that's cannabis related. Well, it turns out every cell in the body has, has endocannabinoid receptors, every cell, the, the nervous system in particular. The only species that doesn't have uh, ATP, uh, doesn't have uh, endocannabinoids are insects that don't have an endocannabinoid system. That's interesting, I didn't know that. So why do we have that? We have it because it's important to us. It's necessary for our function, particularly for memory and for th thought processing, for uh, processing for general energy and so on. So, and I have a, a blog on my website about, uh, uh, about endocannabinoids, the cannabis or marijuana. So that's not in the book, but that's one of the mechanisms. So the key mechanisms that were discovered back in the 70s on what magnetic fields do. So we're going back into the 70s when some of that original research was done in Eastern Europe, causes vasodilatation, opens up blood vessels, relaxes muscles, I mentioned the ATP, stimulates stem cells. So tissue regeneration is a key element of what magnetic fields do. They will heal wounds much faster, typically in about half the time. And one of the reasons for that is it stimulates stem cells and it stimulates growth factors. But in addition to that, you can't grow a garden in a swamp. Right? So you got to remove the inflammation. You got to remove the swelling, the edema. You got to bring in nutrients. You got to bring in circulation. Well, PEMFs do all that. Mm -hmm. just, just like that. And I don't decide what the PEMF is going to do. You don't decide what the PEMF is going to do. Your body decides what the PEMF is going to do in that body. So the, P, the body then will determine what it needs. Improved circulation. Reduced rouleau formation. There was a clumping of blood, vest, of, uh, blood cells. They can't carry more oxygen can't carry more energy. They can't deliver it into the capillaries. They get stuck before they get down into the narrowest cap capillaries. So that's in increasing oxygen supply to the body. It's a key element of what magnetic fields do, not only by circulation increases, but also by the, their effects on um, red blood cells. Mm -hmm. And as I said, there's 25 different mechanisms in the book. And if you, you read about, you want to read the book, you'll get that kind of level of detail. But the key ones are circulation, ATP, um, oxygen, uh, tissue regeneration, stem cell stimulation, reducing pain, and frequency-based magnetic fields pass right through the brain. So what do they do as they pass through the brain? So then it becomes like sound. 
So do you listen to soothing Mozart or do you listen to rap or do you listen to heavy metal? All of those are going to affect your mood. Mm -hmm. Well, magnetic fields can go through the brain and do the same thing. But the nice thing about magnetic fields passing through your brain is they're healing it at the same time. Mm -hmm. Sound goes into your ear, it affects the nervous system and the nervous system relaxes or, or uh, gets stimulated. But, but the magnetic fields do that too. But at the same time, as they pass through the brain, they're repairing. They're improving circulation. They're doing all the things that magnetic fields do. So that's happening in the brain at the same time that it's stimulating the brain function. Fascinating. Okay, so it's having an effect on ATP, the endocannabinoid system, growth factors, stem cells, decreasing pain and inflammation. Uh, those are some of the key ones. So if we were to zoom out from the mechanism level to the sort of um, health problem level or disease level, let's say, what kind of specific problems might one have uh, that would benefit from, from this kind of therapy? And, and based on the mechanisms, I would suspect anything stress-related is going to be helped, anything anything inflammation related is going to be helped, any kind of tissue wounds, like uh, we would expect things to heal much faster. But are there, what, what would you say is sort of the breakdown of the list of medical conditions or health problems that are likely to be helped by this? So uh, in the book, I talk, I provide evidence for how magnetic fields work for 50 different health conditions. That's a long list. So anything with pain, arthritis, uh, autoimmune diseases, anything that has inflammation, injuries. So cut yourself, you'll heal in half the time. Break a bone, you'll heal in half the time. So one of the most valid, one of the most studied actions and benefits of PEMFs is repairing bone. So osteoporosis is a good example. So magnetic field therapy will stop the progression of osteoporosis. It's hard to recover bone once you've lost it, but if you start doing magnetic fields, you won't progress. Cancer is a big area where we use magnetic fields to help with people with cancer. Still a lot of research that needs to be done. You can't say that magnetic fields cure cancer, but they absolutely have to have to control it. Um, for example, stem cells. So there are cancer stem cells. And cancer stem cells reactivate themselves to form metastases to, to get new cancer growing in the body, distant, distant cancers. Uh, if you decrease inflammation in the body, and you decrease those stem cells from being activated. Um, bladder problems, prostate problems, eye problems, brain. I actually did a study on uh, concussion and, uh, and um, brain injury using very low, relatively low intensity magnetic fields. And we saw significant benefits in those, in those patients. They were patients. Um, so that we proved that magnetic field therapy can help them with their function, their symptoms. We haven't been able to prove that it, it heals the concussion because that study was not designed for that purpose. But we absolutely showed that it causes improvements in function. So anything in the brain, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, any inflammatory degenerative disorder of the brain uh, would be helped as well. Sleep, clearly one of the key mechanisms of benefits of magnetic fields is sleep. Why? Again, resonance called entrainment. By slowing down the brain waves, very safely. Uh, you can then control sleep, control mood, anxiety, addictions. So anything that can get you to relax, um, you'll, you'll feel better generally. And you don't, it's involuntary. So the magnetic field therapy is just doing that involuntarily, but it's safe. You don't have to take a drug and you don't have the effects of drugs. In fact, we know that when you take drugs or molecules into the body, even nutritional molecules, um, receptor sites get saturated. And they become resistant to the treatment, to the, to the molecule. Magnetic field therapy doesn't have that problem. Very, very interesting. Okay, so on a personal level, I, I have, you know, I've been a health nut for 25 years at this point, since I was a little kid, and trying every wacky extreme thing I, I could possibly get my hands on. However, I, I never tried pulsed electromagnetic fields until a, a, a couple years ago. And there are two primary reasons why that I'd, I'd like you to speak to. One was two, two reasons why I was wary of it and skeptical of it. 
One was, I always look at things from a, a naturalistic and evolutionarily, e evolutionary lens and say, well, well, what in nature is this analogous to? For example, uh, I've written a book on red near infrared light. We know that, you know, why it would make sense to, to use red and near infrared light from an evolutionary perspective is very clear cut. We are designed to get those frequencies of light, those wavelengths of light from sunlight exposure. So, if, you know, there's this very clear naturalistic explanation of why those things would be good. We have thousands of studies showing that they're good and safe and effective. And we have the, the evolutionary rationale for why humans would respond beneficially to it. But it never was clear to me why that would be the case for PEMF. Like what in nature, where, where, is, where does this kind of thing happen in nature? And so because of that, I always went, well, actually there's one more layer to it, which is EMFs. And we need to speak to that too, because everyone has heard of EMFs, be, be careful of EMFs. There's EMFs from Wi-Fi and from your computer. And, from and magnetic fields are dangerous. Right. And so you have to avoid all those harmful EMFs. And so I had all of that programming in my head. And those two things in, in combination made me go, I think that stuff is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to steer clear of that stuff. It sounds like it may be more harmful than helpful. I think I'm going to avoid it. So can you speak to those two distinctions? And I'm sure they probably need to be separated out. But Let's first of all, the, the evolutionary side of it, where does this kind of thing happen in nature? And the other side is how does pulse PEMFs differ from EMFs? So the body is an electromagnetic apparatus. Nothing in the body happens without a magnetic exchange. Nothing. If there's charge, there's magnetism. If there's magnetism, there's charge. They go hand in glove. That's why it's called electromagnetic. So a red blood cell flowing through a blood vessel is interacting with other ions in that blood vessel and producing magnetic fields as it passes through. It produces charge as it's passing through. And those magnetic fields then control a lot of outside stuff. So they're putting boundaries. It's like magnets. Take two magnets. The, mag the magnets either attract or they repel. The magnetic fields interact with each other, pushing and pulling molecules. Sodium and chloride cannot dock to produce salt unless the magnetic field between them, interaction between those molecules, allows it to dock. So the magnetic field controls that. Physics came before chemistry from an evolutionary perspective in the universe. It was physics. The laws of physics came first before chemistry. Now, we're tissue, right? but our tissue is made of molecules. But what controls those molecules and their functions and their movements and so on? Their actions, interactions, magnetic fields. So at a, at a basic cellular level, at a very basic intercellular level, it's magnetic fields that control all that. Now we happen to live on a planet, which happens to be a big magnet, mm. right? And those, I, those IRs and the FIRs, all the radiation that's hitting the planet triggers and activates charge in the body and affects the magnetic fields in the body. So they can't act without the magnetic fields basically allowing those actions to happen. Because they're there. Magnetic fields are just in the background. They're just everywhere, constantly, continuously. If we remove ourselves from the planet, and go beyond the Earth's magnetic field, the magnet magnetosphere. Things things start to break apart. Okay, we we did experiments in uh, people did experiments in Germany in bunkers where they isolated people from the environment, completely isolated from the environment. Developed essentially what's called a Faraday cage, but it had no magnetic field. They had no environmental stimuli of any kind: light, sound, heat, temperature, etc., uh, cold. Um, barometric pressure changes. So they, these were completely isolated people for months and months. So they were volunteers, months and months. What they found over time is their circadian rhythms became dysregulated. And they figured out why. So they started putting frequencies back into, into, the, into these chambers and discovered that 10 hertz restored circadian rhythm. Wow. So 10 hertz is the basic frequency of the planet. And that's a magnetic frequency. 
and they use 10 hertz as far as what sound vibration uh, they happen to use they happen to use electrical fields okay to put that back into the environment so frequencies from the electrical fields okay so in fact 10 hertz became the basis of an experiment conducted by nasa to stimulate stem cells for cultures they nasa discovered this so the story goes nasa discovered they were growing stem cells in the in the capsule going around the earth and they found that when the cap when the cultures went through the polar regions north or south they had a significant increase in stem cell growth mm. so ah uh, why is that happening mm -hmm. well it turns out that the um, magnetic fields in the north and the south are much stronger the field lines are, are all together they're like this as opposed to like this so again because of that they did an experiment using 10 hertz because of the studies done in um, in germany and lo and behold, there was a four, about a fourfold increase in stem cell growth with mm -hmm. 10 hertz magnetic field exposure. Now, again, everything in the body is magnetic. One of the first uh, approved uses of PEMFs um, is for bone healing called non-union fractures. A fracture that won't heal is a disaster for everybody. Um, and they tried all kinds of things surgically and orthopedics tried different uh, modalities and approaches and, and and um, primarily surgical, of course, to try to heal these non-unions and they wouldn't heal. Well, you have to ask yourself the question, why did it happen in the first place? So it, you can't grow a garden in a swamp. But what the surgery was doing is trying to fix the bone. Mm -hmm. But what caused the problem with the bone in the first place? Whatever caused the problem with the bone in the first place is still there. Mm -hmm. So usually the surgeries fail. So then they started doing magnetic field therapy, discovered it at NYU, and all of a sudden magnetic fields started these um, wounds to heal, these fractures to heal, even though, the, even though the bones were not even together. It started to increase stem cell production and reduce inflammation, improve circulation, just a whole host of different factors were going on at the same time caused by the magnetic fields. So again, that even we, we need that when you walk, you're putting stress on the bone. That's creating something called a piezoelectric field. All of our tissues have crystalline structures in them. They're a crystal matrix. Every cell has a crystal matrix. Our connective tissue has microtubules, which are uh, structures, like, like nanowire structures. And they conduct charge and electricity extremely rapidly. So magnetic fields interact with those, and they interact with magnetic fields. So we are an electromagnetic being at a very fundamental level. Now, again, we, uh, whether we have IR or not, we're, we have, we still, we're still electromagnetic. And the question is how to, how to um, activate that. So we produce our own magnetic fields, but why does a fracture stall? It doesn't have adequate nutrition, but it probably also doesn't have adequate charge. And so once you start to produce more charge in the area of that fracture, the fracture wakes up, Stem cells wake up, circulation wakes up, all these things that magnetic fields do, bingo, six months to a year later, depending on the, the fracture uh, and the person and so on. Bingo, a non-union is healed, non-invasively, safely. Now you may have to do magnetic therapy eight hours a day, 12 hours a day for six months to a year to get that wound to heal. But hey, that's okay, considering the, considering the alternative. Yeah, absolutely. So basically what you're saying is there's all these sources, there are natural sources of magnetic fields and these kinds of frequencies that we are being exposed to and our body is wired to respond to. And the pulsed electro electromagnetic field uh, device is meant to mimic certain of these frequencies. Is that accurate to say? Yeah, um, I just completed an ebook on um, magnetic fields as energy medicine. Uh, looking at things like Qigong and acupuncture and many other things that are considered to be so-called energy medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, dowsing is a good example of energy medicine. It's the use of our ability to sense uh, magnetic fields and electrical fields for that matter. And so magnetic fields basically, again, are a, um, a, a basic modality within our bodies and within the universe that we sense and, and our bodies use it for, for healing purposes. But they're subtle. 
they're very weak. And they're mostly electric, mostly electric in the way they work. But the electric interfa interfacing with the body produces a magnetic. Mm -hmm. And magnetic influences electric. That's Maxwell's equations, Maxwell's laws. So those have been discovered back in the 1700s, early 1800s. But they, they go hand in glove, right? We can't separate them. So, um, so again, it's just it's completely natural to us to have that happening. Now, pulse magnetic fields, in the old days, all we had was the earth. You could walk on the earth barefoot. You could lay on the earth when you're sweating. And your perspiration, the electrolytes in your perspiration are going to interact with the minerals in the earth, in the soil. And what does that do? It creates charge in the body. The charge wakes things up. A, 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 mag, a copper bracelet on the wrist is producing charge. It's acting on the acupuncture points and meridians. That charge then activates all these other magnetic events in the body that stimulate various healing processes. Well, now we have tools. We're no longer ancient. Now we have a, a technology that can take that up multiple levels of, of uh, exactness, but also predictability in terms of results and effectiveness. And we're learning different fields have different effects on the body and you need different amounts of treatment and treatment time to produce the effects that you need. So we're understanding the technology better. So we can heal better, faster than we're ever used to. So even with healers around, how long do people live? I mean, average lifespan is around 80 in the US. Today, mm -hmm. what about a hundred years ago? Uh, I, that I'm sure your answer is, you might not be looking for the answer I'm going to be giving, but the, the tricky thing is like, it was common for people to live roughly as long. However, the average lifespan was brought down heavily by uh, infant mortality and, and child mortality and, and maternal mortality from childbirth and things like that. But that's, that's probably in terms no of longevity, thinking. but that's okay. not necessarily true. Okay. So what is aging? What is aging? Yes. Um, progressive deterioration of cellular health. Aging is death by a thousand cuts. Okay. Aging is all these nicks and scratches and bruises and all the events that happen to us. Mm -hmm. That's without a war and that's without pestilence. One of the biggest causes of mortality actually was infections. So trauma and infections were the two biggest causes of mortality before we lived long enough to get cancer and right. heart disease. Yeah. Right, once we lived long enough to get cancer and heart disease, then they became factors that we didn't calculate before because people didn't live that long. Mm -hmm. So the average age probably was like in 100 years ago, the average age was probably like 45. Mm -hmm. We had the potential, I agree, we had the potential to live a lot longer. Yeah. So yeah. what happens though, if you get an infection, and you have inadequate housing, you have inadequate water supply, you have inadequate food, you have uh, all kinds of other stressors, you know, saber-toothed tigers goring you, or, you know, bison goring you, whatever. So those are all trauma. You have to heal from that trauma, right? In the, in the Civil War, all the people died. They got gunshot wounds. They could have survived, but they, they died from the, from the infections caused by the gunshot wounds. Yeah. And also probably because of in inadequate nutrition and so on. Mm -hmm. So now we, we have these same kinds of events happening to us. I'll tell you, um, in Finland, they looked at people who had uh, massive trauma, ended up in the hospital for months. So they discovered that when they, when they did magnetic field therapy for those people in those beds, they shortened their hospital stays by two weeks. Wow. Because... The magnetic fields are giving the body the uh, stimulus it needs to do the repair work. So now in the hospital, they got the nutrition, they got the rest, they got the care, all they needed. So what they didn't get is the stimulus mm -hmm. to integrate everything else that they were already doing to stimulate it, to activate it. I had a 55-year-old um, guy who had bilateral gangrene of his legs. It was purple. I couldn't see any circulation at all. They came in to get magnetic field therapy and nutrition and advice and so on. He was a smoker, a drinker, and uh, you know had diabetes. Didn't take good care of himself at all. 
And I said, I, you know, I don't want to touch this. This guy's going to die on my watch from kidney failure and sepsis. Because he was being recommended. He came to my office because his sur the surgeon, the vascular surgeon said, off with your legs. Bilateral, below knee amputations. We started, we started nutritional therapies. We started putting on supplements. Got him to stop smoking. Got him to stop drinking. Did magnetic field therapy at the same time. Literally within three months, he went back to the surgeon and said, well, I guess we don't have to amputate. Wow. Amazing. Right? And would medicine have done that? Medicine's solution was amputation. Right. And that wasn't going to stop the problem. Mm -hmm. Right? He's still going to continue having all kinds of problems with his, with all those factors that he's got going on. He just yeah, happened, yeah. you know, happened, would, would not have necessarily happened to have lo lost any more extremities, but maybe he would too. Mm -hmm. Lost his kidneys, lost his vision. So that's an example, a real example in my practice of somebody who benefited from the comprehensive approach. You need everything together. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. I want to go one layer deeper on this whole naturalistic parallels of, of pulsed electromagnetic fields. Uh, a lot of people have heard of the Schumann resonance and the idea that the earth resonates at a certain frequency, I think it's 7.8 Hertz or something like that. It's and, actually more complicated than that. Right. So, so what's the, what's the truth of that? Um, okay. So the Schumann resonances are a pattern of resonances. They're uh, almost, um, uh, what do they call that? Um, Fib Fibonacci. They're almost Fibonacci like in the way they work. So 7.83 Hertz has been sort of classified as the average resonance. So what is, what is the, um, what are they made of? What, what causes those resonances, the Schumann resonances? Lightning strikes around the planet. Mm -hmm. So a lightning strike in Sri Lanka is going to be felt in the US in seconds because that's how electricity travels, right? Without attenuation. So what happens then all these lightning strikes are producing these frequencies and there are, there are patterns of them. There are densities of them in one part of the world and none in another part of the world. And so they kind of average out across the world and that those resonances are in the ionosphere. So what do our brains do? They tune to those resonances. So what are the different brainwave patterns? They're tuned to those resonances. So why do our brains tune to, tune to those resonances? Have you heard of magnetite? I have, yeah. And don't don't anim certain animal species that are uh, that have migratory patterns, like let's say birds or sea turtles or things like that, don't they have higher levels of magnetite? No, they don't have higher levels. But they don't yeah, listen. To, they don't listen to TV or radio. <laughs> They're not distracted. Uh huh. They're completely in nature. So when you're completely in nature, you're getting your signals from nature. You know, native Indians knew all the patterns of the world, right? The earth, because they were in tune with nature. They were not distracted the way we are today. So yes, these animals do that. And that's how we discovered, why are they migrating? How can they migrate? Whether it's clouds or nighttime, they're still going in where they're supposed to go. Mm -hmm. Well, we discovered, of course, that they have these magnetic crystals called mm -hmm. ferrous, ferrous oxide crystals, basically, in, the, in their brains. We have them in our brains too, have billions in our brains, billions. And they're all throughout our whole bodies. So now we recently have discovered that humans can detect a direction as well. Wow, I didn't know but, that. But we have to be quiet. Uh -huh. So they took humans and they spun them around in chairs. They uh, eliminated audio, they eliminated visual, and they spun them in chairs and then asked them what direction they were facing. And a large percentage of the time they figured that out. Wow. Right? We have that sense too. But to go back to that point, if we have all these crystals in our brains, they're like radio crystals, crystal radios. Remember crystal radio sets? I think it was before my time. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, crystals are piez piezoelectric and uh -huh. you can stimulate them with charges and with sound and light and all kinds of things can be stimulated through the crystals. Well, these crystals in our brains are tuners. They are transmitters, actually. So they are receivers, but they're also transmitters. So a guy named Sheldrake 
found, did lots of fascinating experiments. Have you heard of the morphogenetic fields? Yeah, Rupert Sheldrake. Rupert Sheldrake. Yeah. Well, he found that people um, would be sitting at the back of a room staring at somebody's neck. Mm -hmm. And he repeated this experiment over and over and over again. It was like um, everybody looked, but somebody was staring. So what is the person staring at the neck doing, at their head, the back of their head doing? I have no idea. I, I, I mean, my, they're projecting I, a field. Photons. That would be all kinds of electromagnetic stuff, whether it's photons or light or scalar, but they're, they're projecting some kind of connection. They're transmitting a thought uh, to this other person, an yeah. idea, right? So and they're sensing it. So what allows that sensing to happen, I believe a huge part of that is actually the magnetite. Mm -hmm. So it's a receiver and a transmitter. It does both. Is this why my wife can always read my mind? even when I'm trying to hide what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, women are more sensitive than men. I think estrogen makes you more sen sensitive. Uh -huh. I think a lot of women lose that sense after, the, after menopause. Uh, interesting. Interesting. Okay, so th there's still this, this other piece of uh, my wariness around PMS, which is the EMF, EMF. part. And okay. we're all, everybody's taught to, to fear EMS, the dangers, the harms of EMS. Can you break down the, the distinction between post electromagnetic fields versus the kinds of EMFs that are harmful and people should be wary of? All right. So, EMFs, I call EMFs, even though they really are electromagnetic fields, I call them environmental magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. So, environmental magnetic fields include microwaves that are being, you know, in the atmosphere now. We went from 3G to 4G, now 5G, and they're going to go to 6G. So they're being broadcast all over the place. We're, we're drowning in that, those kinds of signals. Uh, that's not man-made. That's not natural to us, at least not in a concentrated fashion. Sorry, you said that's not man-made? You mean it is man-made? I'm sorry, it's man-made. It's not natural. It's not man within right. man, right, that we actually create, create that ourselves. And then so cell phones, Wi-Fi, routers. Uh, are part of those environmental magnetic fields. So they're very short because they broadcast, they're very short wavelengths. And like we discussed earlier, they get absorbed, IR, FIR, et cetera, red, uh, ultrasound, um, infrared, they're all going to be absorbed. And they cause harm because of that. Then we have um, electrical charges through the grids. Our homes are wired and they're producing uh, wavelengths from the electrical system in our homes. They're radiating just like power lines do. And they're rating all kinds of stray frequencies. It's not just pure 50 Hertz. It's what we call dirty electricity. They're what are called transients. So that you get all kinds of frequencies that are in our homes. When we live in boxes surrounded by wiring, that wiring is coming into the atmosphere and it's affecting us. It's very weak. So if the effects are not noticeable like right away. Um, but they, they accumulate over time, especially as we go through our peaks and valleys with our um, immune systems or with our vitality and so on. So when we're vital, when we're really energized and healthy and so on, then our bodies kind of sh shred that off, sh shrug it off, ignore it. So the dosing, the amount of exposure is key. The intensity of the exposure is key. So if you, if you have a, a cell phone to your head, I tell people do this experiment. Make a call with the cell phone to your ear. Look at your ear when you're done. It's gonna be very red. Look at the opposite ear. It may be a bit redder than it was before you started. Now, take that cell phone, put it on airplane mode. Put it next to your ear and hold it there for the same length of time that you would do for taking a call. Look at the difference. The ear with an active uh, signal is cooking your ear. Because of the microwaves. Because of the microwaves. So it's literally, it's enhancing blood flow. I mean, it's maybe that's it's a, not a good way of phrasing. It's, it's heating it's not those just, tissues. It's not just blood down. flow. It's not uh -huh. just blood flow, it's heating the okay. tissue. Uh -huh. It is blood flow too, but it's more than that. It's heating the tissue. That's why microwave ovens work. Mm -hmm. We put meat in a microwave and it cooks it. Whatever you put in the microwave is going to heat it from, in a sense, the inside out. So those are environmental magnetic fields. 
they're not designed to be therapeutic. They're generally fairly low intensity, except for you know these, these you know these exposures that we have that are fairly high intensity. Deck phones, uh, baby monitors, all of these are transmitting signals into the air, Wi-Fi signals, higher frequency signals. That's how they work through higher frequency. So they are not natural, and they cause they cause a major stress in the body. And the body has to deal with that stress. And that's why PEMFs, they cause stress to the body too. If I turn on the light, my body's being stressed. So what does stress mean? There's two kinds of stress, three kinds of stress. There's you stress, which is good stress. Then basically no, no, no stress, you, neutral stress, and then distress. So anything, even a you stress can be distress because it's causing a change, a reaction for you. You have to react to it, you have to deal with it. Sure, and I mean, it's will, possible to, to even overdo exercise to the point where it's damaging. And, it's, and that's true too. So whether it's heat or cold or um, humidity changes, temperature changes, all of those are stressors. Mm -hmm. Sitting in one position, one place for a long time is a stressor. Why do we keep shifting? because it's stressful to those tissues. You put putting pressure on those tissues and the body's sensory system is saying, move, silly. And you shift position and you stay in that new position for a while. And then the body says, move. Mm -hmm. There are other terms you could use besides silly, but our, it's our sensory system telling us. So that's a stressor. So magnetic fields are a stressor. They cause the body to have to shift and change and move. But it's, it's a use stress in a sense. It's a good stress because it's actually causing improvements in function in the tissues, all the different ways that magnetic fields work. So that's, those are the primary distinctions. PEMFs are safe because they go right through the body. They do not stay in the body. They do not get absorbed by the body. So just to follow up on that, is there any potential that magnetic fields uh, could be not safe in some way? Can you uh cause some negative reaction that disrupts something that i don't know causes cancer or who knows what um i i remember hearing one report uh i think probably a mutual friend of ours is dr mercola and i think it was from if i remember correctly a conversation with his uh girlfriend where she told me that she used a, an extremely powerful uh, magnetic field device and it sent her heart into atrial fibrillation or something like that. And we know obviously the heart is using electrical conduction and magnetic fields are affecting that. I, I mean, and that's just a random example, but are, can you think of any any potential consequences of uh, the use of magnetic field? Well, there are certain things that we prefer not to use magnetic fields around. Implanted defibrillators, implanted pacemakers, any implanted equipment in our body, magnetic fields can turn that off. Um, somebody with, who have, has an organ transplant, I can't control the directionality of, of the magnetic field effect in a body when it comes to the immune system. Mm. And with organ transplants, you're trying to prevent rejection. So you're immunosuppressed on purpose. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to mess with that because we don't know how the magnetic field is going to affect that. It may help you. It may help your hand or your arm or your shoulder or your, or your arthritic knee. But I can't control where that magnetic field effect is going to stop in the body. It goes through the whole body ultimately mm -hmm. in terms of its effects. So those are areas where we clearly have to be careful. We say that magnetic field therapy shouldn't be used in pregnancy. That's because we haven't proved that they're safe at pregnancy. Although there's lots and lots and lots of um, indirect evidence to say that they're safe, even in pregnancy, women work in MRI environments when they're pregnant. Right. They're not stopped from working. Yeah. So that's an exposure that clearly we know by default has not been uh, proven to be a, a risk. Mm -hmm. So putting those aside, magnetic as a rule, magnetic field therapy does not cause harm. It reveals harm. So if somebody's getting a, a, a magnetic dose that's too much for their tissues to be able to handle, again, it's a stressor. Your body has to react and respond to it. But if it's too much for that tissue, 
if I did it to you, if I did 30 people with high intensity magnetic fields like Mercola's wife or girlfriend did, um, maybe, only, maybe only a handful would have a problem. To me, if somebody has a problem with the magnetic field, then you want to ask what's going on in that heart. Because mm -hmm. a healthy heart won't do that. That was, it's maybe an early indicator that this heart's got some issues. Whether it's EBV, whether it's autoimmune, whether it's diet, there may be an imbalance. There are lots of people who eat well and take lots of supplements who are out of balance, mm -hmm. right? Because they're not necessarily rationally putting things together. Um, so it, it is, I, I think she did mention to me that she was using a, a, an extraordinarily high power unit in that at sure. that moment. And, and is, uh, it, it, is it possible that using a higher power unit has more potential to cause those kinds of effects? If there's an imbalance. Right. Now, if there's a minimal imbalance, then a high powered unit is more likely to cause that minimal imbalance to show up. Mm -hmm. So if it's a lower, so we have a protocol. I advise people to go low and slow. Mm -hmm. I use the same level of intensity fields that she was experiencing. I don't crank it up. I don't, I don't recommend cranking it up because I don't know how your body's going to react. I don't know what's hidden in your body. There are some clinicians who actually take these high intensity coils, crank it way up, and then put it on different parts of the body and see what the reaction is. So it basically, it's a scan. Oh, interesting. So it's a high intensity scan. If the body reacts, then you know that those are areas that are gonna need some help. Mm -hmm. Whether there's in local inflammation, whether there's an old injury, um, whether there's a developing arthritic process. If I know you've got arthritis of your knee and I wallop that knee with a high intensity magnetic field, don't be surprised that you're gonna react. Mm -hmm. So what you wanna do is go low and slow. What you wanna do is to help to heal those tissues, which is what the magnetic field is gonna be doing. You go low and slow, you're gradually conditioning the tissues to begin the repair process. So magnetic fields cause physiologic reactions right away. But pain is a good example. If you don't deal with the cause of the pain, the pain will come back. You might get relief with the magnetic field from your pain temporarily, but it'll come back. Why does it come back? Because you haven't addressed the root causes. Because it didn't heal the tissue. Mm -hmm. And so that's an indicator to, to you that you, you have more work to do. So I, I tell people that magnetic field therapy is like athletic training. You know, you don't get off the couch and run a marathon tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You're going to train. And you're going to push, you're going to back off. You're going to push, you're going to back off. Your body's going to tell you how much you can push it, how much it can withstand. And in that sense, magnetic fields are the same way. So most of the time, they're not going to cause a problem. Healthy tissue ignores the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. I had this guy who was actually very buff, He's really working out a lot and really healthy. And he was full of himself in terms of how well he was, mm. right? Put a small magnet on his knee. It hurt like heck. Mm -hmm. Well, he cursed the magnet because <laughs> it hurt like heck. What is this crazy, stupid thing doing? It's causing me pain. Yeah. And I said, there's a problem. Well, he ignored it. He went on and did other things. Eventually he came back and did the magnet again. Same problem. And I said, you better go see an orthopedic surgeon. Turned out he had a septic knee. Oh, wow. He had an infection in his knee. The wow. magnetic field covered, discovered it. Wow. He had it taken care of properly, went back and did the magnetic field therapy, working at it gradually, increasing the healing of the tissues, recovery of those tissues, and then he's fine. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So you do have to know how to use your magnetic fields. Now, if you're using very weak magnetic fields, it probably doesn't matter a whole lot but then you're not going to get a whole lot of benefit either. Got it. Okay. So uh, one more thing I would love to talk about is different frequencies. And you, you've alluded to this a bit here and there throughout this, but um, there are a number of claims out there of people saying, hey, use this frequency for this and this frequency for that. Um, to what extent is that kind of thinking legitimate? And if, if it is legitimate, um, do you have any specific recommendations of best frequencies to use for different kinds of problems, let's say treating pain and inflammation or tissue healing or, you know, migraines or depression or, you know, any, any other type of thing? The challenge we have is the research. Mm -hmm. 
if I do a study, I did that, that brain injury study. I did a, um, I used uh, 10 Hertz and we got benefit. 10 Hertz happens to be alpha. What does alpha do to you? It makes you relaxed, right? But we also did that stem cell study with NASA that used 10 Hertz. We, told, we talked about that being the earth frequency. But very little research is being done that compares frequencies and intensities. It's not common. Most studies are done with one frequency and one intensity to treat arthritis or to treat headaches or to treat infections or whatever you name it, whatever magnetic fields are used for. So as a result, we say, well, that's the frequency you should use. Uh, with, with RIFE in particular, and like frequency specific microcurrent, um, it's whispered down the lane. I use 10 Hertz, I got these benefits. So everybody right. says, okay, 10 Hertz does all this. Uh -huh. But nobody studied other frequencies to know which one actually was better than 10 Hertz. Right. I didn't study other frequencies for the brain injuries. I only studied 10 Hertz. So there are thousands and hundreds of thousands of variables that go into the design of a magnetic field. The only time that I get somewhat specific about magnetic fields is the brain waves. So basically I say that all magnetic, all frequencies are gonna help you. Any magnetic field exposure is gonna help you. It, it is directed properly, used properly. So the frequency only matters in terms of the nervous system in the way I use it. Now, again, everybody's gonna have their own experience. I prefer to be science-based. And if you read the book, you'll see as you go through all the different conditions in the book, it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same with red and near infrared light therapy. Most, most research only tests a specific wavelength with one of any, you know, there, there's hundreds of different kinds of devices at different levels of intensity and different surface areas that they're treating. And so each individual study is testing one type of thing. So it's, it's also limited in the same way you're describing. They're univariate. Now, that's a problem and that's okay, but that limits your, your, your choices. It limits what you could potentially achieve optimally. Right. Right. So you could optimize an individual frequency. You could optimize it by increasing the intensity. You could change the waveform. You mm -hmm. can change the, the amount of time that it's being used for. So there's many things you can do with one frequency and then you can optimize that frequency. But it may turn, turn, may turn out that 17 hertz actually works better mm -hmm. with less intensity, less treatment time, and so on. But th that study wasn't done. Right. And that's where it, if, you know, clinical experience or personal experience becomes the key. But if you happen to own one device that's only got one frequency, well, then again, learn to use your device. And you'll, you'll see what the parameters of value are for that device, you know, intensity, time, treatment time, and so on. So ha having said all of those kinds of, you know, couching every, everything around frequencies and those nuances and that context. Is there, is there any area where you, where you feel it has been tested thoroughly and they have, there, there is research to test different fre frequencies for a specific condition and they found, let's say for sleep, you know, to entrain delta waves, let's say, for example, this specific frequency is best or for depression, this frequency is best. Is there any area where it's, you feel it's possible to make that kind of claim? No. Okay. No, but so what I do is I know that if I if I'm in training the brain for delta, I'm going to have to use a delta frequency. It's going to work the best. Okay. And the higher the intensity, the better the entrainment, because again, it's going to grab the brain waves. The brain's going to, not going to listen to other things if it's a higher intensity magnetic field. So ten hertz. What I designed a fle the flex pulse. Is mm -hmm. one of our our equipment, a piece of equipment that we were involved in designing. I got mine right here. So there you go. <laughs> so the Flex Pulse has ten programs, mm -hmm. and one of the key programs is three hertz, which in that I think in that particular system is got ten programs. That means that three hertz is the pr program one. So I use it under the pillow every night mm -hmm. for sleep. Three hertz. Now you'll read about sleep, and the sleep goes through all these different patterns and frequencies through the night. The brain decides what it wants to do. I don't decide what it wants to do. And I used to use audiovisual entrainment and I used to use all kinds of other entrainment factors looking at what the ideal was. But I could never figure out what the ideal was because that changes from day to day, mm -hmm. from night to night, from the beginning of the night to the end of the night. So what we, I figured out over time, especially with neuroscience and having been, done some training with neurofeedback, 
is the brain is going to decide where it wants to be. Mm. But if I pay, pay, give the brain a pacemaker, uh, a metronome, it's going to listen. And it's going to then change its frequency patterns. And we can't make the brain one frequency. It's impossible and not a good idea. Mm -hmm. But if I give it three hertz, the brain can't ignore it. And so wherever it's hyperactive, it's going to start listening and start slowing down into that three hertz pattern. So what you're doing then is you're bringing the brain down to three hertz, which is deep sleep. And we need that. It's very restorative sleep. It should last an hour to an hour and a half at night. But then most people don't have a problem falling asleep. Most people have a problem staying asleep. Mm -hmm. More people have problems staying asleep than falling asleep. But it, this will work either way. But during the night when you wake up or you become aware that you're awake or you become aware of your dreams, you're in what we call high theta. So theta is the frequency that we're in most, most of the night, 75 to 80% of the night we're in theta. But when you're high theta, now you become, you're like lucid dreaming. You're aware of your dreams. And that means that you're not sleeping or you're aware. You're partially aware at least. And so you don't think that you slept enough. What you're doing then when you have the theta, the delta down here, it's kind of coaxing the brain waves down deeper. Mm -hmm. Not into delta anymore because the brain doesn't want to be in delta anymore. It did delta already. So now it wants to be in theta, but you're coaxing it down into the lower levels. So you don't tend to drift up into the higher levels and, mm -hmm. and be awake. And then if you have other organic reasons to get up, like your bladder's full. Well, your bladder could be a little bit full and you got a signal or your bladder can be very full. So what happens is that you don't want to go when the bladder is just a little full. Mm -hmm. You want to go when you need to go. So what you're doing then with Delta, when you're quieting down the brain significantly, then you don't get the urge as much. If you have, a, if you have knee pain or ankle pain, if you have arthritis or back problem, uh, or if you're anxious, even if your brain is like a buzz before you go to bed, but we'll bring that down, we'll just quiet it all down. Mm -hmm. Using that concept of delta entrainment. So when you're trying to, when you're trying to use multiple frequencies and telling the brain what you want it to do, like, a, like it should do, then you're presuming that you know what the brain should do. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're smart enough. Got it. So that's why, that's why I use delta, let the brain decide. I'm just going to give it one frequency. It's going to decide what it's going to do with it. Got it. Now, just out of curiosity, if, if, there, if there is some degree of uncertainty around optimum frequencies for different things, is there compelling evidence for why any frequency should be used? Meaning why not use a static magnetic field? I know there are some like mattress pads that offer just a static magnetic field. How would the benefits of that, if, if you believe those do have benefits, how would they compare with pulse electromagnetic field therapy? I started out working with magnets. That's how I started out working with magnetic fields, is with the static magnets. Mm -hmm. And very, very quickly, within a year or two of working with magnets, I discovered they weren't doing the job. Mm -hmm. They were good with superficial things like tennis elbow, like carpal tunnel. I had some really dramatic results with carpal tunnel with static magnets. So for very superficial problems, they're, they're okay. They're hard to use because you have to fix them in place mm. and, and carry them for extended periods of time. You can't just put it on for five minutes and it's going to help you. If you're going to do that, then you need a really powerful magnet to do that. It's going to be that strong to, to grab those tissues and, and do the, the action in those tissues. So magnetic pads are, are um, the magnets and many magnetic pads are scattered all over the place. And you're moving around during the night. So since magnetic fields drop off extremely rapidly, it's called the inverse square law. You have to determine the magnetic field strength you need for where you need it in your body. Right? So static magnets can be helpful in certain situations, but I have discovered over the years that pulse magnetic fields handily, handily uh, outdo static magnets. And there, I still use static magnets. I wear a magnetic uh, necklace, actually, to help to stimulate the acupuncture points and meridians around my neck. All the acupuncture points and meridians go up through the neck, to the head. So you use a magnetic necklace, then it stabilizes those acupuncture points and meridians. They're quieted down. So that's one, one solution, one time that I use. I will sometimes use shoe inserts. 
But for the kinds of things that we're wanting to deal with are bad arthritis, head injuries, mold exposures, autoimmune diseases, inflammation all over the body, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, arrhythmias. It doesn't, it don't work. Mm -hmm. People want quick results. They want results now. And that's why those high intensity magnetic fields that people have in the community are, can be very effective because high intensity gets your results better faster. Mm -hmm. You just have to know how to use it. And you have to determine the circumstances. And the person who's doing it needs to be skilled at doing it. Got it. Most, most of them haven't read my book. <laughs> I, can, I can definitely tell that. And the, the reason I only wanted to interview you on this topic is because I've listened to at least a dozen or so interviews with, with other people on this subject. And I have been uh, very disappointed in the amount of pseudoscience that is being promoted from a lot of people talking on the subject of PMS. There's a lot of woo-woo wackiness, a lot of people who don't seem to be very scientifically literate or well-read on the research on the subject. And I, I could tell that very easily uh, because I've read your book and, and I would start to listen to these people and go, I, I actually feel I could explain this a lot better and speak to the research a lot better than, than these people who are claiming to be experts on the subject. Um, and uh, you are clearly a, a, a cut above and in terms of your knowledge. It's uh, amazing to listen to you. I've really enjoyed this. Um, let well, me let ask me, you, I, I let me, sorry, let go me ahead. A point about what you were just saying. Please. So the problem is that if your only tool is a hammer, you see every problem as a nail. Right. Right. You got one tool, all the pegs, you got one hole in your board, all the pegs got to fit in that hole. Mm -hmm. uh, now, over the years, I've accumulated a lot of different devices. I've tested and used, and I don't recommend anything to anybody that I haven't tested and used myself. So on drpollock.com, we have a lot of different choices. And we, I do consultations with people, especially people with sicker, with, who are sicker and have significant health issues to get the right equipment in their hands. And then they need to be explained the, how to use it in the right ways. Understanding physiology, understanding anatomy, understanding pathology, understanding disease, understanding how the body heals. When you do that, then people are gonna get much better results. Yeah, absolutely. Right, and they're gonna stick with their equipment. So again, drpollock.com, you can find out a lot more about this sort of thing. If you really wanna learn even more, better, deeper, then obviously the book. Yes. So I have, I have two more questions for you. One is going to be a follow-up on what you just said. But before we go there, uh, are there any, any other technologies, any other modalities that you feel are especially good to pair with post-electromagnetic fields? So um, over the years, have you tried so many different things? Because I'm, I'm always looking for a solution. I was looking for the next thing that you could do. It's going to give me another edge. And I discovered over the years that from a value perspective, for the money that you invest, you're better off owning your own equipment. And then you got to know how to use it properly. So what happens then is that laser has a value. Ultrasound has a value. Infrared has a value. Red light has a value. Uh, ozone has a value. Uh, marijuana has a value. All of these things have their values, but for the money spent, magnetic field therapy does so much more. So you can go to a doctor's office and get treatments and that's okay. And then that's appropriate at certain times where it's the best by going to a doctor's office is for an acute problem, something that's gonna resolve quickly. For example, if you have surgery and you have to heal your wound, well, you know it's gonna heal on its own, probably no matter what but you can heal it a lot faster using magnetic field therapy. In that circumstance, there's a short course of treatments and you're done. But if you have horrible back pain, you have spinal stenosis, you're bone on bone in, in, uh, in your knees or your hips, this is, this is a lifer. This is a lifetime problem, unless you have a joint replacement. So that means that you're gonna to need to do magnetic field therapy on a daily basis, at least once or twice a day. And even for aging purposes or anti-aging, how many times a day do you need to do treatment? I would guess at least once. Aging never sleeps. <laughs> so I recommend twice a day. First, first thing in the morning to clear out the cobwebs from the night before 
And then at the end of the day, to clear out the stress of the day out of your body, any, any even good day is a stress day. Sure. So obviously a bad day, having a car accident or falling down or having an argument with somebody, uh, that could be a more stressful day. And then you, you certainly need the help. But every single day is you stress no matter what. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, you're kind of balancing everything back out again. Yeah. Now, if you have addition, if you have health issues on top of all that, then you need to even more time and attention with the magnetic field. Yeah, got it. So I, I have to say, um, I, I want to get your recommendations for specific devices, but um, I got this, which is one of the key devices that you recommend, the FlexPulse, and I've been using it for a while now. And I've used it for a number of things. I've used it for some neck strains as I've been traveling around with my family, staying in different Airbnbs. I've been in lots of different workstations. And depending on the, the sort of ergonomics of my, my desk situation, my computer situation, oftentimes I get neck problems and my traps and uh, little neck strains and other things going on or in my mid back. Um, I've had, I had one day where I had a random toothache, which is something that almost never happens. And um, my wife had a migraine one day, and I had a few little injuries here and there from playing soccer and, um, and frisbee with my son and um, little you know ankle sprains and things like that. And I have been enormously impressed with extremely noticeable effects as far as pain reduction and how fast it speeds the healing of that. And I, I also want to say um, just about... I think it was maybe a month and a half ago, maybe two months ago. Um, my mother, who's in her, I think she's 76 or seven, maybe she's 78 years old now. Um, no, 70, I think 76. Uh, she got a hip replacement just a couple months ago. And this is not an exaggeration at all. Uh, this is the actual truth. It's almost unbelievable to say. I probably wouldn't believe it if I was hearing it but she only had to use painkillers, the medication that she was got, that she received after a full hip replacement surgery. She only used two doses of painkillers, two. And after two days had basically zero pain. And my mom is not the, not, not the most pain tolerant person in the world. She's not an athlete. She doesn't have enormous uh, like toughness and ability to, to deal with physical pain or anything like that. She literally had no pain after a full hip replacement surgery. I mean, I was in shock. And the reason why I think the only reasonable explanation is that she was using this flex bowls um, at pretty much all day. Uh, exactly. That's the key right there. Yep. Yep. For, for uh, right after that hip replacement surgery. And so I'm, I'm absolutely blown away by, by how effective it is. And um, having come into this whole thing around PMS, like I said earlier, with, with so much skepticism and wariness, I've now been converted into pretty much a full believer into in, in the power of this technology to help heal tissues and have all these different benefits that, that you've been talking about. But let me ask you, what I, I'm, I'm also aware that there seems to be a lot of different devices with a lot of different sort of wacky claims, and they all use different technologies and intensities. So I am still very wary of trusting pretty much anyone else's device, except the ones that you're recommending, uh, because I trust that you've, you've done, you know all the specific nuances and, and um, specifications of these different devices to discern which are good and which are junk. Um, but so obviously you recommend the FlexPulse, which is the one you recommended to me. And uh, are there any other devices that you recommend and I would also like to request, and I don't know what your answer to this is going to be because we didn't talk about it beforehand, but I'm hoping you might be able to offer somewhat of a discount for my listeners. Um, we certainly can. So we can right. offer a 10% uh, a, a discount awesome. for your listeners. Thank you for that. But they're going to have to purchase within the next month. And then we need to come up with a, a coupon code that they can use. Okay, let's let's do energy blueprint. Energy blueprint is fine. Energy blueprint. Great. Okay, done. Wonderful. So, what what specific devices would you recommend? And are there distinctions of what problems you'd use for for one or another device? Well, I'm going to. Um, I didn't want to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I've got a new book coming out. So the um, 
the book that you're reading there, the Power Tools for Health book, is a, a more fundamental book. And it provides you with a lot of the science. For those people who want that kind of information, that's the book to get. So basically, that book is going to be a companion to the new book, which is called Supercharge Your Health with PE and Allison. Cool. In, in the Supercharge book, we're talking about, you got this problem, what devices should you consider for that problem? Because there is no one, no single solution to problems. And some things work better than others. And the basic distinctions people have to get is, do you want to do local or do you want to do whole body? Well, actually, do you want to do local? Do you want to treat a chest or do you want to treat the whole body? So you need to make those three decisions, local, regional, or whole body. And we lay out for 80 different health conditions, lay out the, the magnetic devices that are best for those conditions. So I can't say that this one is better than another. Ideally, you, you tailor it to what you need. In the long run, if you're gonna make the investment, because you know the um, Flex Pulse is inexpensive, relatively speaking, it retails at 1290. All right, now some of the, I have devices that are not quite like the one that Mercola's girlfriend used which is $35,000. Whoa. I have a device, uh, several devices on my website that are $20,000. There are other devices on the website that are like 13,000. Mm -hmm. So they're higher intensity. The higher the cost typically means the higher the intensity is going to be. Right now, as, as we speak, as we're working with PMF systems, most of the very high intensity systems are that cost over $13,000. Are now being, in a sense, overshadowed uh, by another set of devices that we have from Israel that are high intensity and much lower cost, but they're whole body and local. So you could do both whole body treatment and use local applicators for more specific, um, faster results. So intensity matters. And that's an important point that I was making in the Power Tools for Health book. Intensity matters a lot because mm -hmm. magnetic fields drop off very rapidly. So, for example, a 4,000 Gauss magnetic field four inches away, that magnetic field, four inches away, will be down to 4,000 Gauss, will be down to 15 Gauss. Wow. So, and if you need 15 Gauss, and there's a blog on my website about adenosine, which is not in the Power Tools book, mm -hmm. and I do describe it in the Supercharge Your Health book. What that blog tells us is that adenosine is critical for inflammation in the body. And you need 15 Gauss optimally, optimally to address the adenosine receptor but there are adenosine receptors all over the body. So if you need adenosine, 15 goes at the skin on your wrist, then what do you need for your heart? What do you need for your brain? So, so you have just, to, just, just to clarify that, are you saying exactly 15 Gauss or you need at least 15 Gauss? It's gonna be optimally 15 Gauss. Okay. So if you were less than that, then it's still gonna provide some benefit to you, but you're gonna to have to do longer treatment times. What if you're at 4,000 Gauss? So if you have 4,000 Gauss, it'll work faster, much faster, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. It is, it'll still do the job. It won't create- 4,000 Gauss will, depending on how deep you need to treat. Okay. So if you have to go, if you're treating from the front to the back of the brain, the head, how, how long is a head front to back? Mm -hmm. It's about nine inches. It's about six inches across. So you have to judge the distance where you're trying to treat. And ideally what you want to do is to treat the whole body. But if you have, a, if you have a, a tumor or had a blow to the head that's right here, it's very superficial, you don't need as much intensity. Mm -hmm. But for concussions, you don't know where the damage is. So you need, you need a strong enough magnetic field to go through the whole brain. Uh, the same thing, say, for example, a hip is a big joint. So if you have to treat the whole hip, then you're talking about a pretty significant distance front to back for that hip. Mm -hmm. you know, again, it could be bigger depending on the, on the person. So the, the blog, that blog, the adenosine blog, if you go to drpollock.com and, and on the search box on the right side, type in adenosine, it'll pull up that blog, explain why, and there's a table in there on the intensities you need at the distance you're trying to treat. Got it. To optimize that, uh, that um, uh, intensity, 15 gauss. So let, let, me, let me, maybe if I ask, if I give some spe specific scenarios, maybe we can break it down sure, uh, sure. a little bit easier. So let's say, first of all, I've got less than $10,000 to spend. Let's say, because most people are going to be in that situation. There's going to be a subset of people who are wealthy and they don't mind spending 
huge chunks and, of and money. And quite frankly, these days with the flash devices, mm -hmm. they're called flash. So it's multi-flash, um, premium flash, and ultra flash. They're made in Israel. Those are the most cost-effective devices that we have right now. Okay. So let's say I've got- High enough intensity and a very reasonable price. Got it. So let's say I've got less than $10,000 to spend. I want to treat whole body. Yeah, I'm interested in anti-aging, longevity, and just keeping all of my tissues in tip-top shape. Um, and I want to use it every day for, for, for anti-aging, a whole body device. What specific device would you recommend? So several considerations for just if you're very healthy and you just want basic um, health maintenance something like a biobalance could work very well it's only 10 gauss so what these low intensity systems are doing one of the key actions of magnetic fields is to stimulate acupuncture points and meridians so the biobalance will stimulate all the acupuncture points and meridians in the body that'll help to rebalance you if you have bad arthritis and you want anti-aging if you're a performance athlete and you've got every performance athlete has all kinds of injuries mm -hmm. they're in denial but they have all kinds of injuries yeah I, i've been an athlete all my life i can definitely attest to that right you you want to just put that aside i don't want to admit that i have these problems <laughs> so if, you, if that's the case you need higher intensity mm -hmm. so with higher intensity the the devices that i would recommend again are those flash devices the multi-flash is about 4,000 gauss, and you get a whole body pad, and then you get a smaller applicator to treat local areas. Now, if you have if you do that, then you have to treat separately because it only allows one applicator at a time. And that machine costs you about um, $5,800, $5,600 for just the two applicators. Mm -hmm. And that's giving you 4,000 gauss. That's pretty strong. By comparison to other, there are other low intensity devices that are available in the market that are $6,000 and you're getting one Gauss wow. or less. Right. And shall I name names? Please. Yeah. It doesn't hurt my feelings. There's a whole bunch of them. So there's like the Beamer, the IMRS, the QRS, the Meditera, um, are, uh, there are others that are, um, oh, I forget some of the Vazendux. OMI, they're very popular. They're very popular because they're very inexpensive. But again, you're getting less than a Gauss. Wow. So that, you're really not doing a whole lot. If you're treating a problem, it's not going to do anything for you. Mm -hmm. But because it helps the acupuncture points and meridians, people feel better. They feel good because when you stimulate the acupuncture system, it releases endorphins and enkephalins, and you feel good. Mm -hmm. You haven't healed anything, but you feel good. <laughs> right? So for for the health maintenance again the biobalance is adequate there's another device called also in the parmeds family of devices that's about 75 gauss for the whole body pad so it's about seven times stronger and it's only about 35 only he says 3500 dollars and it's got a smaller applicator that's about 200 gauss which is still pretty decent downside of that machine is it only runs 30 minute cycles so you can't run it forever flex pulse you can run until the battery dies Right, so most of these devices are time limited and how long they'll work for. So the multi-flash is 4,000 Gauss. The premium flash is 7,000 Gauss. Same features as the multi-flash, but it's much stronger magnetic field. And then you end up at the cat's meow, um, which is the ultra flash. And the ultra flash is about 8,000 Gauss, causes muscle contractions like the very high expense, high intensity expensive machines do. And a full system of that is only about 80, 80 he says, only, only about $8,300. So you're getting a lot of power there. And you have four, four applicators. You can run two whole body pads at the same time. You can run a whole body pad and a smaller applicator at the same time, creating what we call the magnetic sandwich. Or you could use two small applicators at the same time, different parts of the body. Got it. And then, and then you have the flex pulse for treating smaller areas. If somebody's got a neck strain or a tennis elbow or, or a knee, an ankle strain or knee pain or something like that. They can and very active people. Most of us are very active. We don't want to be tied to an outlet because mm -hmm. all these other pieces of equipment need power from the wall. Mm -hmm. So you have, you're, you're locked in, you're plugged in. You have to sit there and do your treatment. So if you want, uh, and I do this, a number of people end up buying, say, something like a multi-flash, which is reasonably uh, affordable and high enough intensity most of the time, 
they'll add a local treatment machine. Mm -hmm. So if you have um, plantar fasciitis, or if you have a bum knee and your knees just flared up now, and you want, you got lots of things you got to be doing. You can't be sitting in the house doing a treatment. Then you could use your um, uh, flex boss. Mm -hmm. Got it. I have one final question for you. You've mentioned the adenosine ATP mechanism. I'm wondering on a, on a, on a big picture level, have you worked with, with people who are dealing with chronic fatigue and awesome, where, you've, awesome. where, where, you've where you've seen a tremendous improvement using this technology? Constantly. Um, there's a whole field of research that's coming out now. Most of the research now that's being done with magnetic field therapies is actually being done using very high intensity magnetic fields ca called RTMS or TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. So they're very high intensity and they treat a whole range of problems. Like chronic pain, for example, you should be treating the brain as well as where you have your pain because the brain is part of the problem. Now it's actually part of the problem. And these people have what are called, what's called allodynia. So once the brain starts to kick in as part of the pain process, even touching the hairs on the back of your hand can cause pain. Mm -hmm. So the brain is interpreting all any signals coming from the periphery, even simple signals as potential pain signals. So um, let's go back to your question. Chronic fatigue. Chronic fatigue. Now, you've got mold toxicities. If you have other environmental toxicities that are poisoning your metabolic cells, more metabolic processes in your cells, then yes, mitochondrial. Mitochondrial disease is, uh, mitochondrial deficiencies are whole body. All the mitochondria in the body are being affected. But where are the most common mitochondria? Where, sorry, repeat your question. Where are the most, where, where we have the most? What mitochondria, mitochondria are the most uh, uh, needed and are the most active in the body? We have, we have the most, the highest density of them in, in the brain and heart. Brain and heart mm -hmm. and muscles. So when we're using our muscles, muscles need the uh, mitochondria to be functioning and you need the ATP. Mm -hmm. So if it's basic, it's whole body, then you need whole body ATP. But there's a problem with ATP. We produce our body weight in ATP every day. Mm -hmm. Every ATP molecule in the body recycles about 200 to 500 times a day every molecule. So we're constantly recycling. So when you're doing magnetic field therapy, you'll feel really great for a while. And then it sort of falls off, depending on what your supply of ATP is already, right? If it's already really, really, really deficient, you're going to need a lot more work to get yourself up. But again, you still have to deal with the cause to, as much as you possibly can. Chronic inflammation, autoimmune diseases are one of the major causes of chronic fatigue. And they're, again, they cause peripheral muscle problems because of all the inflammation in the body, but they also, chronic inflammation dramatically affects the brain. So people who are significantly overweight are producing a lot of cytokines. They're producing a lot of inflammation in their belly fat. But where do those cytokines go? To the brain. So you have to, you have to treat the brain. You have to quiet down the cytokines in the, in the body, which then quiets it down in the brain. Very, very interesting. Okay. And so it, but in your experience, you, you've worked with chronic fatigue patients and seen big improvements. Yeah. So chronic fatigue patients are one of those groups of patients that you don't, you have to go really low and slow because mm -hmm. they don't have the reserves to deal with adding more stimuli or more stress of the body. So you have to do repair work. You have to gradually decrease the inflammation in the body until finally and ultimately, you know that you've arrived when you can use the highest intensities for the longest time without a problem. Mm -hmm. It's like training. Yeah. Once you get to that peak, you're there. Yeah. And what do you need to do to maintain? But that's a, that could be a very, very, very slow road to get there. What happens in my experience has been the people who do pulse systems, pulse devices, uh, even though they're more powerful, if you control the, the process of increasing the intensity and the time, uh, you do that right, you should repair faster. The frequencies, the frequency-based devices that people are preoccupied with frequencies because the internet is loaded with that. You, you talk about rife and micro frequency specific microcurrent and, and all of these people talk about frequencies. But too many frequencies, the body becomes jangled. The nervous system just becomes too overwhelmed. 
And so you, the simpler you can keep it, if you just basically do a pulse, let the energy field go through the body without jangling things, then you produce better results faster, generally. Awesome. Dr. Pollock, this has been so fun, uh, so insightful. I really, really enjoyed doing this interview with you. And thank you so much uh, for sharing your wisdom with my audience. Uh, your website where people can go to get these devices, they, they can get them right on the, the website, right? They can get them on drpollock.com. Okay. And it's spelled D-R-P-A-W-L-U-K, correct? Yep. Okay. Dot com. So it's like paw and luck, but luck without the C. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Pollock. Really, really enjoyed Pleasure, this. And, and I hope that we can do another one soon. Maybe Please, when your I new book so, comes I out. I hope so too. Wonderful. And you, might, you certainly might want to after the new book comes out in the late fall. Wonderful. And to everybody listening, highly recommend grabbing one of these devices. If you can afford it, get one of the big fancy ones that, that he talked about. Um, but I can tell you this, the, the, the cheapest one that they offer, the Flex Pulse, has been enormously beneficial for me and my mother. So even these don't, don't feel like you have to get the, the you know, $10,000 device in order to get any benefits from this. Uh, you can absolutely get amazing benefits from these, the lower price, price unit, the Flex Pulse. Um, and I highly endorse it personally. And I can tell you, my mom definitely endorses it, given the results she's had. So Dr. Pollock, thank you again so much. And uh, hope you guys, everybody listening, I hope you enjoyed this. And I will see you again very soon. Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next one.